Hey everyone, and welcome to this new episode of Co-Creating with AI. I'm Martin, and with me as always is Rasmus. How are you today, Rasmus? Pretty good. I'm deep in uh, kind of uh, generating some lengthy stuff, trying out some new workflows, and uh, I'm particularly like uh, quite excited about the results, but also quite annoyed about trying to get AI to stick to a word count, uh, which yeah. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm realizing we're... You, you thought so as well, like, I need guardrails for that. We can't just, like, allow it to do that itself through prompt. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so pretty good. How are you? I'm good. Um, I am working on, uh, yesterday I spent the entire day integrating a Google model called Yamnet, which does sound event detection. So, like, dogs barking and uh, uh, stomachs rumbling and airplanes flying and so, like sound like that uh, is great if the uh, conversation AI listening to your sound can comment like oh, what's going on in the background it sounds like a really persistent dog wants you wants you to pay attention to it or something but um, so I'm having fun with that and uh, it's amazing uh, still I'm amazed to, like the transition for me this fall to from calling APIs that cost by by call to running AI models on the GPU where I can just I, like do whatever I, I want for as long as I want. It doesn't cost anything by call. I'm, not, I'm still that in, in sort of an excitement about that as just my a, a new opportunity and a new reality to relate to. Uh, regarding what you said about word count, I actually have a, a tip there that you see with if you use ChatGPT um, for this kind of stuff, text generation, you can. It's super bad at at generating its own word counts, right, or sticking to it. And but you can ask it to generate Python code that measure the word count. So mm. then you can add, write something, and then please generate Python code to measure the word count and iterate if you are not sticking to the metrics you give it. Right. Yeah, you need to yeah. you need to like actually allow it to iterate to do that. Yeah, and also like um, in when you ask GPT to chat GPT to generate something a long like a long thing like a blog post, uh, then a really good practice is to ask it for an outline first, so it thinks through how should this be structured, and then you can ask it like give every section in your outline a word budget or as like a a character budget and then measure afterwards how how did you do and like iterate if you didn't keep the, the the budgets because then it will also the result will be less um how to say uh, repetitive like if one symptom of ai generated text is that every section has the same amount of paragraphs every paragraph has the same amount of words and every word is like the same length and it like looks very boring so asking it for a um, um, like a word or character budget for each section, which is uh, the, like more varied, then uh, that will create more varied output as well. Yeah, that is it's pretty funny actually because like that's very human kind of. I if I'm writing something, I wouldn't you know count the words. No. When I'm doing it, if I would have to stick to word count, I'd have to like count them or like use a word counter right in in yeah. In office or whatever, and then and then iterate. So it's interesting. It's like that. That it's quite human in that sense. Like because, mm -hmm. and if you want to integrate the kind of more hard science stuff, you need to like allow it to do math with like code interpreter or something like yes. that. It's pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, anyhow, tangent. I think so. Yep. Uh, uh, so today, today what right? yeah. yeah, what are we going to talk about? Uh, talk about today. Do you think? I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm pretty like um, excited to keep sort of drilling down into kind of the real world of, of how like what's being built and yes. uh, just read like a great article which we can link to in the show notes uh, from Greylock on kind of vertical software, which is kind of their you know term phrase going from vertical SaaS like software as a service to like more broadly vertical software and and how AI is enabling that for a lot of new verticals. Um, mm. uh, for example, like with, um, with like healthcare and fintech, etc., where there's a lot of like unstructured data, like in sorry in finance and healthcare, etc., uh, where there's a lot of unstructured data, and now you can actually build like very vertical uh, 
a kind of very niche or deep or shallow, but like very niche uh, use cases for all those industries. And uh, so I just think that's like quite an, quite an interesting thing that I'm, I'm thinking about a lot just for multiplier own business and, um, and just like in the market in general. Um, yeah. Do you have any like any thoughts around that? Like what's what's available now, what's coming? Um, well, my, my thoughts are a lot around what's been uh, released recently with Google Gemini and what they are promising and uh, like <laughs> failing, like promising and immediately failing to deliver, uh, but uh, also on Mistral and, and their release uh, of their new models in the past couple of days. And they, they of course, uh, made a, like Google, like paved the road for a very, very slim release that got a lot of attention from Mistral when they just tweeted a magnet URL uh, as as their launch message. Like, as the, here's the model, download it, and uh, and nothing else. And, uh, and so that's it's a bit of a, a nice um, jab at Google there. From Mistral, and uh, of course uh, they are really killing it with their with their development, and it's great to see a EU or a European pr- perspective or or initiative that is doing so well in the open source space. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We just actually uh, got like access to Mistral and and like gonna try like start trying it out. I was actually surprised to see that like on many metrics, it's like outperforming GPT three point five, and it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. Like if I read it correctly, yeah. which is actually like, if that's the case, then that means that open AI is not like pushing their margins down to zero, right? Because they must be better at running this efficiently with the kind of the mm-hmm. Microsoft support, et cetera. But that they're actually, you know, this of the cost in, of intelligence going to zero, it will really happen quite quickly, yeah. you know, with this like level of competition across the globe and everyone undercutting each other to kind of mm-hmm. get API usage. It's... um which is great, you know, that just means that, you know, you're going to have so much, many more things being available, like from a cost perspective, so much, mm-hmm. much quicker, which I think is relevant also in, in terms of kind of like which applications will be built for vertical use cases, because if it's, you know, if it's cheap um, to apply it in a lot of different places, even if, you know, the value is, is incremental or, or you know, uh, just save so, some time or save some cost or save some headache, um, I think those like that that fits together for me. Like when I see these new models, of course with the mm. multi multimodality etc. as well. But just that the cost is going down so quickly, it's going to enable so many things. Yeah, I think uh, it's amazing that GPT three point five Turbo, uh, which was released just a month ago, is now beaten. Like the Mistral is uh, performing similar, which is a big news in itself. But also like at forty percent lower cost. And yeah. uh, that's a huge uh, step down in just just four weeks. But that's 3.5 turbo, right? Not it is, yes. Yeah. Four turbo, and, yeah, exactly. And the reason why that's what we need to compare to is that um, as far as we've seen yet, nothing is comparable to GPT-4, although Google Gemini is claiming to be there on the metrics and then on user experience, it, that, could, that could be a different story. We don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also with like Claude 2.1, they seem to be, you know, catching up in, in some things. But mm-hmm. of course, like reasoning is where like GPT-4 has been, you know, the outstanding choice so far. And then, of course, with all the different kind of the tool set of GPT-4 mm. with, you know, code interpreter, etc. Um, is as far as I know, not matched by anyone. Has, like, have you tried, like, can you try Gemini now? Right? I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it. No, you haven't tried it. Okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not super keen either. Like they're, as far as I know, they're not making the Gemini ultra model even available. And so not yet, yeah. why not yet? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not interested in trying out something that is inferior. Just that, that's just, I don't, I don't spend time on that. Yeah. Hmm. And that's actually interesting. Like now we are so like, we are AI nerds, right? And yeah. even we are like, so kind of like our schedule is so busy with trying things out that we don't even try out Google's new model <laughs> right now. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like, it's interesting if like, you know, how quickly saturation is going to come yeah. to, to this space also. Like mm. if you're using ChatGPT and you're pretty happy, are you going to try other things and switch? Mm. Like, is it going to be like, are lock-ins effects going to be like high or low for these like mm. 
general level models. Like I'm, uh, I'm unsure, but it's definitely like things are moving so quick, like so quick. It's it's like actually prohibitive almost. Yeah. Uh, for like trying things out. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I uh, also been thinking recently a bit about uh, governmental use of AI and uh, and there are a few different angles that that have come to me uh, i have a really a good friend who is into metamodernism which is in in the us it's referred to as integral theory which is about how to understand uh, the fast pace of everything in the world and like when information just great goes to a gray goo without any discernible um, like what is a fact and what is a lie and and wh- whose opinion matters this the this week as opposed to last week and and uh, metamodernism is, is a take on that where you uh, sort of allow yourself to oscillate and you you realize you you accept that where the world is a complex place and it, then black and white opinions are no longer valid and uh, so you can you can oscillate between standpoints ai can one day be be uh, dangerous and another day an opportunity and that's fine and that's that's the way the world is and um, so he's he's creating a meta modern uh, gpt assistant uh, using uh, some like uh, literature on the topic and by heinz freinacht is a is a pseudonym of some swedish writers on the, on that topic and uh, and having a lot of fun with that and he he works like in the, the high up in uh, swedish government on um rebuilding how procurement like uh, official procurement works it's super amazing that ha- he's so interested both in ai and like a new take on how society could be structured and uh, another uh, friend i spoke to recently also is using a lot of syn- uh, synthetic data since um, since they are not allowed to <laughs> upload uh, their their data to to APIs, especially not APIs in in uh, other countries. Uh, he's working on, on with synthetic data instead and just generating reports that look like the reports he would like to upload, and then then fine tuning and working on those reports that, that just is just made up, but they're still the same structure. So we can make proof of concepts and so on with OpenAI APIs without endangering the the, the, the safety of of uh, governmental data. But I think that's pretty interesting in terms of like vertical, like government is definitely like a vertical software opportunity that is likely, you know, now bigger than ever with AI because there's so much like unstructured data mm. like in, in there, which is where, you know, AI really excels like this, these new large language models um, in terms of like, you know, it's all documents, right? Like when you Mm. think about like government, at least when I think about it, I don't know about you, but like it's like documents, right? It's documents and forms and like lots of text and everything. Uh, And and all of these protocols of like Mm. the the municipality meetings everywhere, like all over the world, like like there's so much unstructured data about what is going on Mm. and like how are our, our societies actually governed? And all of that is unstructured. Yeah. And in terms of regulation as well. I mean, when mm. we talked about this previously, like some friends of mine are doing it in like one vertical, like just helping, um, um, I think, architects, etc. understand um, like regulation and make sure they follow it. But like when you think about government, it's all regulation and like mm. process and protocols and like documents uh, with, uh, with notes, basically, in different forms. And... So, so I really think, like, if you if you just look at, like, you know, just a general frame here, right? We started with these, like, you know, the models, right? With, you know, OpenAI, of course, Microsoft, and, and then Google, Mistral, etc. So all of these, you know, will probably stay horizontal or foundational, you know, uh, very much. And then these vertical opportunities, I think, is where, like, for like, mm. entrepreneurs, at least, in this in this industry, that's like really the opportunity. And that was also like, like the point of this Greylock Ventures article. But I think government is like such an interesting one there that you can really see innovation kind of happening 
now, at least I can, just because you don't necessarily need to take, you know, all their systems and data and remake it. You can just, they can keep whatever systems they have and you can just take the data and, and, and make it available and get value from it and, you know, automate this little process or that little process or give people access to information, you know, through mm. like building, like using AI to build a kind of uh, services or like workflows on top. So like, mm. it's very interesting. I could really like see that as being the enabling technology for like reforming, you know, the kind of inefficient and, and less appreciated parts of, of government. Yes. I think for most people. Yeah. Like and a nice I, vertical opportunity. I have a great uh, example as well of, of a simple vertical opportunity grasp uh, in this private sector. By There's a Swedish company called Prosperous Planet that helps companies to do purchasing in a climate uh, conscious way. So for the uh, Presbyron is a really large chain of, of um, I don't know, like stuff that you, that you, that you buy to consume in the moment, like uh, candy and, and, and uh, drinks like sodas and so on, stuff like that. And the, they have a huge turnover and uh, most Swedish people buy from them at least once per week or something. And, um, and um, so the way they purchase their inventory, of course, has a big uh, impact on, on the in, environment footprint of all of Sweden. So, so if they, for example, want to lower the amount of, uh, of um, bad, uh, what was it, palm oil, and so on that they they purchase they they can they can it really matters how they pick their suppliers and so prosperous planet is helping companies like that in, in to to make good decisions on and also to look at data and see how does uh how do we impact uh make the best impact with the smallest amount of decisions like where does it matter because mm. if they they can change the suppliers of a thousand products that have very little turnover, and maybe that though that that is a huge amount of work, and might not have as big impact as just cha- changing the supplier of the biggest product. So they do that kind of the, the data massaging and uh, have sh- show really great results. And um, one one thing that they have done is to, which is sort of a from the start was a side kick uh, or like a side project for them that, that they they created um in, this was before custom gpts existed they created a rag uh, chatbot where they fed into since all of their customers are, are getting suppliers on a global market they just uh, uh, fed a media feed uh, of everything relevant to to a single customer into a data vector store and created a summary every day. Like here's the summary of you new news that is affecting mm. your business, your your purchasing uh, globally uh, today, and and just the AI produced a small summary of that, and that turned out to be hugely popular uh, with the clients and mm. is something that they are starting to look into as a as a business like a, 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 a not a side business anymore, but part of their main business. Mm. That's a nice, like, vertical use case. Um, and was that, like, the example where it actually searched as well? Like, it, it was fed in some th- RSS feed or something, I think right? they, what, they, what, what I've seen so far is uh, that they made basically made summaries and then linked out to the articles, so they didn't provide yeah. a search. But I think that's so, like, uh, search is also a good way to to expose uh, the the resulting data of course yeah i mean it's it's uh it's funny because like i can really like i i'm trying to envision kind of like you know a year out or a few years out like where like where is this going and what i sort of imagine actually is that there's going to be so many very very niche mm use cases, whether they're in the form of like, you know, custom GPTs or they're in the form of like, uh, I mean, vertical software um, that are like more, I guess, more ambitious uh, or internal software. I was in, uh, I was in touch with a, a big Swedish retailer 
that that was uh, building all this stuff in house actually mm. and like unexpectedly in my view like if i it's like a you know like a kind of a you know furniture like a mid-sized furniture retailer and mm. they were like really investing in this themselves and building out like basically building in these capabilities across their own software stack mm. um of you know they they're kind of um um systems for managing you know their inventory and and their uh, you know website content and, and their you know e-commerce store etc uh so it's it's like it really just feels like this is going to enable so ma- like much quicker i mean on the topic of like i think it was the last episode and we had my friend rasmus on here like it it really i think it, the main way this might like change kind of company formation and software building like building software is just that it's it's so much cheaper to make something very niche and very like that is valuable because you can take this unstructured data uh use it to provide some value and it's quicker than ever to get something off the ground yeah uh so i could it, it could really be like the ultimate unbundling right that of course you have these like high level like foundational models that you know from these big players that are used just like the cloud providers, you know, will be, still be used mm-hmm. for building applications. But I can, you know, yeah, I can really see it like being, you know, that, you know, we look back at, you know, the past 10 years where it's like there's a billion apps in the App Store. But that was like the, that was the version of the internet where you had like, didn't have a lot of apps. Yeah. And then in the future, you have like literally, you know, uh, you know, trillions of apps. In, in mm-hmm. the sense that, but where like, what an app is is like is very small. I, I don't know. Like I just like it feels like there's that could be a route this is going, but I'm not clear. Um, mm. Does that relate to you? Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that um, apps, uh, what we def- call an app and uh, like define as an app, are going to change as well. That that uh, since we since we can build AI assistants ourselves now. Uh, we want great tools to provide to those assistants or GPTs. And just to provide the tools is also another app layer for, for companies. Mm. Like that furniture store, they maybe they should have an like offer an API, which is an, an AI tool, uh, so that people can just give their assist their own assistance uh, if they want to buy furniture. Like mm. here's here's the purchasing API. Mm. or the inventory API of uh, one of my favorite uh, furniture dealers. And uh, and maybe that should be discoverable uh, just from their web page. Like uh, uh, the, the big semantic web movement a few years back, where now it's not, it's not um, apparent to the consumer how much of that influences e-commerce strategy, but but the semantic web is everywhere now. Like the data we see on the web is structured so that comp- machine learning, and not, not machine learning, but rather machines, classical machines can can understand the, the e-commerce data. And Google is indexing all of that. And when we search for shopping results in Google, that's the semantic web data that comes up. It's become like this big e-commerce uh, interface to the world. And uh, uh, what can AIs do with that? And are is are there new like data discovery standards needed to discover AI tools instead of, of that? That's that per, is perhaps also a, a, a niche use case uh, someone should address with a startup. Yeah, I mean that's actually pretty interesting. Like, are there going to be like because we all already have kind of the API economy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense that there are like really successful companies who don't have a front end. <laughs> yeah. Like you just use them for yes. like, like literally, I mean, maybe they have some kind of front end, right? But like mm-hmm. pretty much, you know, they mm-hmm. just have an API that basically gives some kind of capabilities out to other types of, of uh, software. Um, but yeah, maybe there is like, maybe there is something there as well that there's going to be literally an app economy just for like AI to use. Um, do, you, do you like, do you come to think of anything that like where, you really need to because right now all the like chat gpt plugins and all the mm. uh, um i mean the actions in now in the system mm. which is like the generalized versions it's, it's using you know existing products that are meant for humans 
and have mm. APIs, and now you're allowing them as actions for you know ChatGPT primarily. You can do it other places. Yeah. But can you imagine like what what would what type of like apps would be something you have to build for an AI that is not just like already an app for humans or you know also an app for humans? Mm, I I think that um, uh, most of the AI companies are actually that they are building APIs that will be consumed by by AIs. But but uh, also just like the the human apps all also in the future will increasingly need API versions. Like so, booking a hotel right now, I'm sure there's an API for that, but. I, I will need to need to go look it up and it's not top of mind for me and yeah. uh, and uh, what I think is that uh, maybe that should be discoverable and it's need like it's it's becoming a competitive uh, factor for yeah. uh, in the future for for companies to have that discoverable like no matter what your business is to, to provide an AI friendly endpoint for that or uh, AI will move for, forward faster in being able to use human interfaces. So they, the AI yeah. will actually start to use the web and or the mobile apps as as UIs. That actually goes alongside. Now I think we've been a little bit everywhere today, but <laughs> uh, it's like you know this talk about Google. Like some people basically say, I'm you know taking extremes here. It's like. Yeah. Yeah, Google, like you know, Google's search business is fucked. Hmm. You know, because now more and more people are going to you know ChatGPT, or even when they go to Bard, right? Or hmm. you know, they ask something, they get the result, they don't necessarily click the links, right? Yeah. Even if they serve the links, it's like, why do you click them? Hmm. And uh, you know, Google's business is mainly uh, you know cost per click and and CPM across their ad network, right? People going to websites, seeing an ad, etc. But like the main thing is like the sponsored links, right, in the uh, search result, and people clicking them. Um, so that's like one extreme, and the other extreme is kind of like Google. You know, they started this stuff with AI. They have you know the best talent. They have all the data. They're going to win this race with AI. I think there's like one like interesting thing that I actually like heard from um, like was a bit of a discussion with all in podcast, but like that I reflected on, which is like. It could, might be that, you know, both of these are kind of true, uh, but that Google, you know, has a really good place in the future anyhow, because what happens is actually search becomes irrelevant and the actions that we talk about is what becomes relevant. Mm. So, for example, you, okay, so let's just say if, if I, three years ago, I go into Google, I maybe search for, you know, a pair of shoes, Right. And then I click around or something like that. Right. Or a grill, like, you know, barbecue mm-hmm. for my house, you know, do to go around. And then three years from now, I just write, you know, best barbecue. And then it gives me some suggestions. I click or choose, or I just allow it to pick one for me. I gave it input and then it purchases it for me. So then mm-hmm. like it's, it goes beyond, you know, the CPC model where it's like search, click, choose it. It just goes straight to purchase, which is, yeah. you know, similar to like Google flights. If you just like have that integrated with, with you know Bard, it just books mm. the flight for you, etc. Mm. So I can really see like where you know yes, search will go down, uh, but they might be you know like in the future that will be replaced by you know you're searching for something because you want something, you want an answer, or you want mm. to buy something, or you want to like there's something else you actually want, not just getting the information normally. Yeah. Um, I don't know, just random, like thought thought around that. Uh, that yeah. you know, that's where my will we on. will we want our AIs to take paid results into consideration when they when they use actions? No, but I think that's the that's the point. I think that's like yeah. that. It's just going to be irrelevant. Probably not, right? And Google's, mm. go, I think Google's business model or whatever the AI's business model will be different. When it's like when you're in there, because it can't be clicking links, you know, that's that's what Google was for, right? But that's yeah. not what Bard and ChatGPT is for. It's not like mm. finding links to click. It's doing something or learning something yeah. or yeah. you know, answering something. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the case still holds that, you know, Google has been this dominant, you know, in search and they're probably not going to be that dominant in like the AI era. So that's, you know, a case against Google, I guess, but, but yeah. it's, uh, you can really see search transforming there into something mm -hmm. much more useful. Awesome. So this has been uh, sort of a, a gathering up uh, random thoughts of late uh, episode and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, still this has been valuable for, for uh, you as a listener. And uh, in any case, um, we'll be back next, ep next episode with uh, perhaps even more scattered thoughts or focusing on, uh, <laughs> on a very specific topic. And uh, but above all, um, thank you, Rasmus, for this episode. And to the listener, uh, if you want to email us, we always appreciate uh, feedback or questions. And uh, we are Martin or Rasmus at multiply.co. Great, Martin. Thanks a lot. Thank you, too.